You're welcome back. This is Newsfile. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. And we get to look at matters arising from the budget that the opposition MDC failed to block. They had intended to block it. And there are some people who are disappointed at them for that failure. Um, because for those who disagree with very many aspects of the budget, they were the hope of the country to stop it in the form that it is. We have been informed that if they were successful, then the country was going to be held to ransom at least for several months, governments may have run to a halt. This show is brought to you by the candid sponsorship of Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and close as a partner, <coughs> MTN, everywhere you go, Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa, Duraplast, where Duraplast goes, water flows, having mosquito spray and coil, pleasant on humans, tough nightmare on insects, and Napa Foods, it's tasty, DBS Industries, <coughs> that's your roofing people, Robert & Sons Limited, Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care services provider. Now, let's settle for matters regarding the budget. Um, our friends, John Ewua, Chief Executive Officer, Ghana uh, Association of Bankers, uh, say hi to us if you are live on Zoom. Dr. Theo Champong, Economist and Political Risk Analyst, say hi to us. And here in the studio, Fifi Fiave Kwete is former Deputy Minister for Finance and for some other sectors, and former mem uh, member of, of the Finance Committee of Parliament. Um, Dr. Stephen Amoa is MP, that's a, the latest doctor in town, <laughs> the latest PhD in town, is MP uh, in Shiaiso and former CEO, Microfinance and Small Loans Center. Steka and Fifi, welcome. Thank you. All right. So, yes. Uh, so, let's begin uh, <coughs> briefly with John Ewa because your matter is a bit circumscribed. You have been so unhappy that you are being asked to take the 5% levy to before tax to defray the outstanding commitments in the banking sector. Government has committed 21 billion in that sector. Um, how else do you want government to fund this? Thanks, Samson. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to put on record that banks in the country are not um, against government mobilizing revenue to help with our developmental efforts and um, our quest to achieve greatness as a country. And uh, what we are uh, fighting or protesting is a seeming attempt um, that is aimed at targeting the banking industry, which we believe um, is not only misplaced, but could potentially be counterproductive. Uh, first, let me just take us two steps back. Uh, during um, uh, towards the middle of last year, when COVID was at its peak, banks came together and set up, uh, uh, with almost without any compulsion from anybody, uh, a 10 million COVID relief fund to help uh, the country in the procurement of PPEs. Uh, we donated to the Noguchi Center. We donated, we donated to doctors in residence. If you go to all the public universities, district hospitals, you will see something that banks have done uh, right physically uh, and just by um, uh, looking around. Um, we talk about the infectious disease center and the banking industry contributed 2 million Ghana cities towards its construction. That aside, um, if you speak to the commissioner general, any of the senior officers at the GRA, they were test to a compliance level when it comes to the payment of taxes. We are one industry that really does not need compelling in, uh, in order to meet our obligations to the state in terms of um, tax payment. What we are saying is we are in an environment where 
um, we are fighting stability because of instability and uncertainty uh, that has been introduced by the pandemic. And all efforts should be towards how we fortify our banking systems to anchor the growth or the economic recovery process that we are all fighting for post-COVID. And we do not think you achieve that by limiting banks in our capacity to, to deliver on that um, agenda. Um, but if this new levy passes, and bear in mind that banks are already paying a 5% levy, and let's not forget that this is not the replacement of the levy banks are already paying, that national stabilization levy that banks are paying, and which we have been paying since the year 2000 or 2001, was supposed to be in place for just three years. But what we have found is it has become a routine fixture in revenue mobilization, and banks have been paying this levy since 2001, and this is 2021. 20 years on, we are still paying. It was supposed to be a temporary measure. It is now a permanent fixture. This tax, if allowed to be in place, and it is targeted only at the banking industry, could potentially hamper or reduce our ability to help with the economic recovery process. During COVID, in the midst of all the uncertainties that we all saw, banks were at the forefront making sure that the rules of the economy did not ground to a halt. We provided liquidity to the uh, business community, to households and to individuals. We, we gave in excess of 14 billion Ghana cities in new loans. The sectors that were negatively impacted by the, uh, uh, the coronavirus impact, uh, 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 coronavirus, and here we talk about the leisure industry, we talk about the education sector, we talk about the religious sector, and you know you can count them on your fingertips. All these sectors, when we say they are being negatively impacted, we don't complete the statement because they are all banked by the remaining banks we have currently in the country. And if the businesses are struggling, it means they were struggling in meeting their commitments to their bankers as well. So what did we do? We sat with our customers and over 4 billion Ghana cities in loans have either been restructured, uh, a repayment stopped, or uh, repayments have been postponed, some companies getting as long as one year in repayment holidays. So the banking industry has really stood our ground to help with the economic recovery process. And also we serve as a catalyst for any impact of the virus having a serious you know, uh, impact economically on the country. And that is why we believe that this is not the time to introduce a layer of tax that will seek to make the banking industry unattractive in attracting uh, uh, private capital. We are all talking about uh, continental free trade and that we are not competing only within Ghana, we are competing on the continent. And if the tax regime in Nigeria post-COVID is where it is, uh, 25 percent the tax regime in Cote d'Ivoire um, is around 25 Nigeria I believe is 30 percent and other parts of even just our sub-region in West Africa we are gradually putting banks in Ghana on top of the tax the table in terms of industry that are heavily taxed mm. and if you were a private investor looking for opportunities in the sub-region uh, uh, to provide liquidity to the banks to take advantage of after would you look at Ghana which would have an effective tax rate of in excess of 35%, or you look at Cote d'Ivoire, which effective tax rate would be in 25%, or Nigeria, which would be around 30%. So it also hampers our competitiveness mm. on, the, uh, on the continent. Yeah. And we you, are all you, complaining mm. about cost of doing business in, mm. in the country. Right. You, Any effort that seeks to add to the cost of doing business should be resisted, not just by banks, because the overall impact will be on the economy. Mm. And we are all working towards reducing cost of lending, reducing the cost of doing business. And this is just going to work in the, uh, in the negative. Right, did you say? Adversely impact uh, the cost of doing business. Did you we say? That if we had been engaged, perhaps there are other avenues of even getting more without necessarily leveling just the banking industry. And again, finally, no, no, the characterization no. of the mm. justification for the levy that to to pay for the uh, banking sector debt, clean up debt, it connotes a seeming attempt to blame the remaining banks 
for the alleged infractions of the banks that went under. And I think it is not something that the remaining banks want to shoulder, that uh, perhaps there is a report somewhere that we have not seen that say that we were complicit in any alleged uh, misdemeanors or crimes or whatever that led to the collapse of the uh, banks that are no longer with us. So okay. these are the, the basis that we have um, for challenging the imposition of the levy. And we believe that we, there is opportunity to go back to the table and see what can be done mm. and not to levy and target the banking industry. Okay, so a couple of issues from what you have uh, said so far. Uh, you talk about giving approximately 14 billion um, in loans to support COVID recovery efforts, correct? That is correct. So that is loans. And that is business yes. for the banks, right? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, so it's business for you. So why are you complaining? You are happy that okay. you have opportunity to make money. No, no, uh, uh, to the contrary. During the pandemic, um, and I'll come back to that uh, point you just raised, we rather even reduce our lending rates in response to the regulatory measures uh, that were announced by the central bank uh, by reducing the cash reserve requirement from 8 to Seven, uh, uh, 10 percent to eight percent, lending rates of the banking industry reduced from up to 350 basis points. And to your question, during crisis and uncertainty, what do bankers do? We hold on to any further financial intermediation because we want to understand the terrain. So banks could have taken the very easy route by saying, no, COVID has introduced different varieties of uh, risk. Let's try to understand it. But doing that wouldn't have been to contribute to the solution of the problem, but would have contributed to deepening the woes of the country and economically wouldn't have found ourselves where we are at the moment. Mm. So it was not more or less a business decision, but it was a decision to keep the country running. Mm. Because in uncertainty, bankers are not known to be lending money. They mm. are known to be recalling and even recalling uh, exposures on the market. Yes. This is profit before tax. Is that not so? That is correct. Right. So how does it affect competitiveness? OK, so let me tell you this. Um, a profit before tax translates into two things. It either translates into taxes and a, a, a dividends or contribution to reserves. The central bank, knowing very well um, the impact the uh, COVID pandemic has created in the environment, mm. has been in constant engagement of banks, particularly with restrictions on payment of dividends. So if you are a bank now and you want to even pay dividend, the central bank has clear, clear milestones you must meet and you, a justification you could make or you have to make before you could make dividend payment. Why we agree with the central bank is, the central bank is looking at the bigger picture of creating stability and helping the banks to build our absorption base. You know, uh, uh, on, on, unlike mm -hmm. other industries where when you make revenue, you take and then you move on. When banks make revenue, it follows us throughout the life of the loan. Yes, but so you, you are, you are, today, you are, you are. Tomorrow it come back as yeah, bad loans. Yeah, but you so, are returning, you are returning payment uh, after tax uh, in excess of 100 million, not so. Uh, please take that again is back to the question why I'm saying, I'm asking how this affects competitiveness uh, when you are returning a payment of the tax uh, of over 100 million. Yes, it, it affects competitiveness because um, we, 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 are, uh, we, we, we are private businesses and private businesses exist to meet shareholder thresholds and also contribute to taxes. Mm. But what this uh, uh, imposition is doing is limiting banks' ability to accumulate additional capital. And by accumulating more capital, it enhances the bank's ability or capacity to write or sanction more loans. My final we question to you. looking at the broader picture of the impact the imposition could have on the broader economy yeah. because a, a, an imposition of 5% levy, even if you net off additional tax, you are talking about about 2.3 billion in loans bank could have given that they cannot give because right. of the levy. Right. So you guys agreed in the industry 
that the cleanup saved the industry from collapse, correct? Yes, we, we agree. Okay, so if you did, why don't you want to participate in what has, you know, held you to make, to keep, to stay alive and make, and make business? So, so, and that is why we have said we are not against uh, any attempt at plugging fiscal gaps introduced by uh, 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 cleaning up the banking sector. Banks have never said that. What we are saying is the attempt at levying just the banks connotes a, 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 a signal of a complicity that the banks were the creators of the, uh, the downfall of the banks that went down. But that is very far away from the truth. That is not what happened. Okay, so and you say the that... The cleanup of the you, banking you, sector benefited not just the banks, uh, it helped, benefited the country, and it benefited all active participants in the economy. Right. So to just pick one sector and say you should pay the price, uh, we do not think it's fair. That, that, that is why... More so that is why you say... That sector to be at its, that uh, is why you thing. say... That is why you say if government had consulted you, uh, the consultation would have led to government getting even more and not from only the banks. Uh, what are the alternatives that you have on the table? Share them with us. So what we are saying is, it's about tax incidents. By levying 5% on banks, how about it saying uh, this was an economic decision to save the financial system? It was not to save the remaining banks. It was to save the financial system. So how about saying that Okay, the mining companies are part of the financial system. They benefit, we undertake transactions for them. So mining industry, you take 2%. How about the telcos? Saying that you also are participants in the financial system. Okay, telcos, you take 2%. Banks, you are key anchors of the financial system. You take 2%. If you put all together, you are getting about 8% mm. of a bigger pie. And then the incidence of the tax will not be to overburden one sector to be footing the bill of an agenda or a decision that was taken to clean up a financial system, mm. not to clean up just the banking sector. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, John Ewa, Chief Executive Officer, the Ghana Association of Bankers. Um, I, 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 I was hoping to, to find out finally in some 20 seconds, now that you know the budget <laughs> is a done deal, is passed, what are you going to do? You just have to pay. Um, we, we do not think it's a done deal. It's still a proposal, if I should put it that way. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and we believe that there is still opportunity for further engagement. The government has proven to be um, a listening government. And we, since we have raised very valid arguments mm. in support of You're potentially right. broadening the net so that the incidence becomes lesser mm. and does not a point to an attempt to target an industry. Mm. Uh, we believe that there are opportunities for further engagement and potentially All right. either a, a reversal or reduction in the levy. Thank you very much, uh, John Ewa. Um, now, uh, Fifi, you have had the opportunity to superintend a ministry at the presidency over the financial institutions. Do you feel that he has a fair argument or the bank, uh, bank, Bankers Association Ghana Association of Bankers have a fair argument when they say that there was an opportunity to spread this rather than saddle them with it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, and good uh, morning to all your many viewers and listeners, and uh, to my brother, uh, Stephen Amor. Uh, yes, I think I do, I do sympathize with what uh, uh, he just said. Uh, I don't, I don't think it is fair <coughs> to, to limit this to just the banks. In fact, to be honest, I, I think it's even completely unfair for banks that clearly were not having issues to now be made literally to be carrying those that have issues. I think that's completely not fair. I mean, what that means then is any bank in the future believes that, listen, no matter how uh, I misbehave, uh, at the end of the day, other banks are going to. So there's no incentive for doing what is right. Neither is there a, a, what you call a penalty for doing what is wrong in, the, in that respect. So mm. to understand, I do, I do, I do think I do I, I understand exactly where he's coming so from. So he says it does look like all hope is not lost. Mm. Um, do you share his view? Because people think that your MPs, mm. whom they have their faith in, 
have once again failed them because the budget is now passed. Actually, uh, what happened is simply a vote on the principles of the budget. Oh, that's what happened yesterday. I mean, we, uh, they, they, we are not going to go into the real details where committees are now going to subject various policies into scrutiny. So there's actually still an opportunity, I mean, as we head towards the final appropriation <coughs> and all, to still be able, I mean, to, uh, I mean, to do things about it. So I don't completely agree that everything, I mean, every hope is lost. I think. Okay. Uh, because there are still major things that are going to be discussed between now and to the final appropriation. So there okay. is an opportunity. Right. Um, and Stephen, and um, Johnny, where thinks that you, you have a, a listening <coughs> sure. government? Do you think there are prospects that uh, the government will listen? That at least. But how do you do this without consulting the sector? That's, that's so unfair. <laughs> Um, thank you. My regards to our viewers this morning, particularly those from Inshiaiso. Uh, Samson, you are a legal practitioner. I really don't know whether there is a legal requirement with respect to this. Other than that, I wouldn't say that would have been bad, but I also don't think if it's not a legal requirement, this is very, in terms of my opinion, something that should be used to condemn the whole decision-making process. What I think Our lives must not be entirely run by law. I think it must be run by common sense yeah, but, and fairness. But there are alternatives. So you can't say one alternative does not stem from common sense. Or, no, you are no. taxing a sector. You didn't consult them at all. I'm saying that is that a convention? And you are taxing them 5%. That's huge. So we need to analyze the figures. It's a banking sector. Mm -hmm. We cannot just say five, two, three, banking is good or fair. No. We need to find out what has been going on. We deal with policies and figures and then finances that actually drive the entire country. And we need to find out whether that decision making process... Is there an opportunity for a reconsideration? Oh, can, I, can I flow a bit? Can I also say... Because there are a lot of issues to... The question about. is, is there an opportunity for a reconsideration? That's it. I think it will depend on the analysis of the whole thing, which I want to talk about. Because I think, I think the banking industry did themselves. Uh, to an extent, nobody wants to pay tax. So probably from that angle, they are also raising issues. But let's be also fair with this government and the policies preceding to this. That even in this COVID-19 economy, go and check. Capitalization of the banks, the year 2017, was about 4005 million, uh, million. And then 2020, under this critical situation, it was, <clears throat> sorry, about... 963 million in terms of percentage increase in terms of capitalization it's about 140.52 in terms of percentage that is extremely unprecedented and even beyond that because of what the do you government, mean free money given to the banks not free talking about a condition that has made it possible for them to even have bigger capitalization he was talking about two if you look at government decision to ensure that they manage if you force the banks to raise okay. their minimum capital. And it brings a situation you are excited about. Why should you want to take a praise for that? No, no, I'm not talking about praise. I'm talking about good policies eh, from Central Bank of Ghana and the bank as a whole, as, as, and the government as a whole. Mm. That led to even, I mean, higher capitalization, which is extremely key in all the performance appraisals of the banks. And even to the extent that the banks are also able to retain this because of dividend policy. Because industries were going down, even the stock exchange had to grow, I mean, went down, if you're doing trend analysis, from 14% to 12 point whatever, whatever percent. You come to the banking center, the same banking center, remember under Nanado's government, mm. financial, uh, sorry, uh, is it financial services tax of about 17.5 was scrapped under the banking sector. You look at the document I'm holding here, because of the cleaning exercise and the good policies of the government, Central Bank of Ghana, almost all the key performance parameters that are good for the banking sector, I mean, is really, really doing well and having positive growth. Mm. But then we need to understand that everything has to be done in, 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 in a way to ensure that there is some amount of pragmatism and dynamism to ensure sustainability in the system. If even my brother from the bank is talking about the, the fact that there are alternatives, yes, every decision-making process has a goal, and there are alternatives to it. Even the figures he's talking about, 2% for mining companies, telcos 2%, banking 2%, that would have accrued more money. Mathematically, that is wrong. How can you say that? They have different turnovers. 
they have different scope of works. They have different fund generation, revenue generation. They have different expenditures. So how could one have even made this, I mean, arbitrary statement? I think they might have had a case that I am not an internal stakeholder. I'm not a deep banker now working with them. They could still sit around the table. I don't know if that is possible because I'm not a legal person. It borders on even if it's approved by parliament, what would have happened? Mm -hmm. But they should analyze these things in a context that will really, really, really help the country rather than limiting it to their industry because the government embarked on a lot of policies that really help the banking sector. Mm -hmm. And the evidence of it, he himself talks about the fact that the industry is not really doing well. We so have, if they want to do that, they should come up with figures. We have heard experts like uh, Richmond Kwame from Pong, mm -hmm. uh, investment advisor, who suggests that you may also have to consider that oftentimes for the political talk, you say Kufour's regime got banks chasing, you know, after people mm -hmm. to come for loans. Mm -hmm. They are telling you that you are going to make banking very expensive. This is going to be borne by the customer, you know that. No, you should argue, but let's also understand the regimes are different. Akufuado's government, President Akufuado's government, came and met a dying banking industry. We all know. Go and check the 2016 uh, 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 is it State of Nation address by former President His Excellency John Romani Mahama, where there was an extract about DKM and then the decision they had taken to clean the system and that there was going to be continuation in terms of comprehensive effort. So the, the president today, the government today, met a dying industry. But with that, we're able to put measures and policies in place to adopt the right of Every politician, new regime, every new land. regime comes to meet a dying industry and a dying yes, yes, economy. Yes, no, no. Uh, don't worry. It, it was meant to be brief for your brief comments on yeah, this. Then we'll go into the budget I, topic. But the challenge I'm having is yeah, when yeah. I'm landing my statement. No, the challenge I am so also having difficult. is that you are not answering me directly. <laughs> my question is that do you take into account mm -hmm. that these banks mm -hmm. will find the money from us, the customers, and what that will mean for the banking industry. That's what they are telling so you. So when the, when, when the 17.5 was deducted, what happened? And let me also explain to you, every financial statement has, my brother knows, has three lines of, three profit lines, the gross margin, the operating margin, and the profit after tax. So even there's also a reducing effect mm. on the taxes that will be have. That is a fact, okay. because you reduce the amount that is going to be taxed. Mm. So as much as I understand what you're talking about, they should accept the fact that in terms of solving the immediate needs of this country in terms of funding up, because look, no president fund projects from his good pocket money, mm -hmm. but from his good, uh, I mean, policies. And what is happening within the banking sector today, looking at the fact that even it's going to have reducing impact mm. on the taxes that will be done before after profit will also be reduced. Okay. So you're looking at the situation, the banking please sector so is no, not no, going no. to collapse. Please, please. Mm. And I think they need to be fair and okay. very holistic. All right, place. thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Thea Champong, briefly, what would you say about how the, bank, the banking industry feels about the 5% levy? Um, yeah, good, good morning uh, to you and your listeners. Um, I think I support uh, John's position, I think the taxes, uh, especially on profit before tax, are a bit regressive. Um, more so when you look at the fact that we are just coming out of right the pandemic and you want to sustain um, economic recovery and the banks are absolutely crucial to it. So yes, the government um, did provide the, the bailout uh, in 2017 to about 18. We've seen an improvement in the um, indicators of the bank. So I was just checking the March 2021 Bank of Ghana um, financial data. And if you look at like asset quality on non-performing loans, um, it's, it's about 15%. Um, the capital adequacy ratio is around 20 or so percent. These are all good, but I don't think this is actually the time to impose such a tax. Um, I think you need the banks to consolidate a bit further. <laughs> you need them to support, especially the growth, right, that we're expecting going forward in 2021. Mm. And this only sends, the, for me, the wrong signal. Mm. And importantly also, I think there is a punishment here, right, which is say that, well, you caused the financial crisis, 
and so we are punishing you to pay this, you know, uh, five percent um, levy uh, before tax. Okay. Um, not all the banks were corporate in in causing the mess, mm. but this application of the tax across the board, and more so um, on even the before tax profit, I think yeah, it sends a wrong signal, and they are quite a bit regressive. And probably look, the banks will at the end of the day find a way of passing it on to the consumers. All right, thank you. Um, so, Fifi. Yes. When we look at the bank and the question of the taxes and also the issue that there is no going to be pay increases or significantly for workers, what do you say? Yeah, first let me know something. What time do we have left? Uh, so I know exactly how to, how, to, how to move according to what is available. What time do we have? Yeah, let me just have an idea. Make your presentation in the next five minutes. Let me see. Go ahead. In the next five minutes? I'm watching you. <laughs> Five minutes is a lot of time on prime time. No, not according to what I... Please go ahead. You go ahead. Of, the amount of stuff I have to say... You go ahead. ...difficult to be mm. able to make that. Anyway, first let me begin by, by explaining that um, this whole fetish about the meta financial sector that was in collapse. I mean, please, let's, 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 stop, let's stop this. Let's stop this. <laughs> uh, this is not the first time I told that this country has had financial issues. Okay, when we came into office in 2009, we met uh, a, a, banking, a banking sector that actually was in difficulty because of a massive debt that was left by Tor on Ghana Commercial Bank. That actually threatened not just to collapse but Ghana Commercial Bank, but to bring down the whole financial sector because of the importance of Ghana Commercial Bank. We took care of that without any noise, hmm. without any problem. Around 2015, 2016, there was a legacy of what you call energy sector debt that was threatening to collapse the whole financial sector and at the same time also call us energy companies. We took care of that with minimum funds, without, without destroying any financial sector, without crippling jobs, without causing a collapse in the financial sector. So this whole situation, to create the impression, see the only way this could have been done is to do some of the things that have been done by this previous government is totally not true. Okay, and this is not the first time mm. as well. We've gone through what you call a financial sector adjustment program in the past. It was also done the same way with that minimum minimum fund. Mm. So let's, let's really put, 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 I mean, put, put that at, at the side. Now, the whole problem really, something, is that we are dealing with a government that simply went for broke in an election year <laughs> and they totally expended way beyond what they needed to. And today, you and I and the people of Ghana are being made to pay what you call the price for that electioneering recklessness and they use COVID as the excuse COVID is not was not just limited to Ghana COVID was happening all over Africa all over the world but ask yourself have you heard of Cote d'Ivoire implementing any of these draconian measures after COVID no have you heard it in Nigeria no have you heard in Togo no have you heard in Benin no in Rwanda no no country is taking this route as we are taking you know the difference because whereas they concentrated on COVID, we use COVID as an excuse to go for electioneering recklessness. That has actually caused us the problem we are having today. So that deception needs to be completely explained. That what we have today, I heard uh, 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 Ewa and the rest, all of them are saying, oh, you know what, well, we need to allow them to raise money in order to be able to develop the country. But it's not the same as allowing them to do what they did electioneering, I mean, to, to, to destroy what you call the finances of this country, using election, I mean, as an excuse, hiding under COVID, and then come around and penalize the people of Ghana through the kind of taxation that they are bringing. That is the first one. Two, when it is you are asking people to make sacrifices, then you yourself must be seen to be doing the same. Take a look at, for example, the Office of Government Machinery, their budgeting. And you see the amount of money, for example, they've made available for compensation. Moving from 138 million last year to over 850 million this year. Now, you do such a thing and you expect that the people of Ghana can understand you, of course they will not understand you. You are asking them to, as it were, suffer the penalty. All these new taxes that you are, you are, you are, you are heaping on them, threatening to collapse banks, affecting the, I mean, what you call the hardship in the country because of your own electioneering recklessness. Then you turn around and open your own, what you call, belts to be able to continue feeding large while asking other people to suffer. No, they will not. 
If you look at, for example, the, the, the details of what had happened, you will notice that apart from what you call the compensation package that had gone up from 136 million to over 820, 23 million, goods and services at the same level also gone up from 356 all the way to 501. You have a contingency of 187. <clears throat> in a year that you claim that things are difficult. In 2016, which was an election year, Continuances to the 67 million. Normally in election year, you actually have much more difficulties. Therefore, you, you allow for greater contingency because so many things can happen. In an election year 2016, 67 million for contingency. And you in a year that you claim things are so bad, asking the people of Ghana to make sacrifices. Sacrifices because you yourself decided to do so many things, hiding under COVID. Today, you are asking everybody to make sacrifices while you yourself want to continue living large. It's absolutely unacceptable. Now, as I said, this whole COVID excuse must be totally, I mean, I mean, taken out. Because until we appreciate that the government has simply gone for broke in election year and caused problem, we will continue believing this story and allowing them to do what they are doing. So the effort, for example, by different groups to say, we simply don't think this is, uh, this is acceptable, is right. You ask public sector workers that somehow they should I mean, be, be getting ready for the possibility of not seeing any wage increases. Until 2024. Until 2024. Why? Oh, what's the name? Uh, advisor of the finance ministry. Dr. Ashon, Ashon, Ashon said the same thing. Now, I'm saying when you make pronouncement of that nature, when you yourself cause the problem, because so all this is what? Oh, we gave you free water, we gave you free electricity, and that's supposed to be the excuse? But the people of Ghana did not put a gun on you for you to do so. I can appreciate that for a period of three weeks. And remember, lockdown was for maximum three weeks. The finance minister himself came and said, Ghana's economy cannot sustain a lockdown of beyond three weeks. Why? Because it's largely an informal economy. 90% of this economy remains informal. Now, after three weeks of lockdown, give and take, even if you say, oh, as a result of the lockdown and all the difficulties, informal sector is suffering, therefore we make another additional, maybe one month of, of free day. Other countries, that's exactly what they did. But because they had election in mind, pretended they were using COVID, they did this all the way to the end of the year because of elections. Then you turn around and ask that the people now should come and pay the penalty because of your own, what you call, electioneering recklessness because you wanted to win power at all costs. That actually is literally adding insult to injury. You understand? So it's important for this to be properly explained in order for the people of Ghana not to allow this to happen. Now, there are so many other things that I want to say. For example, if you look at, for example, the performance of this, of this economy, even ahead of COVID, that, uh, that tells you that the problem was already there. Problem relating to debt stock, even by 2019, things clearly show that this government really, really was already I mean, I mean, going overboard. You came in a period of 20, from 2017, you met a death stock about 220 billion. By the time, of, by the close of 2019, we were talking about adding close to about 110 billion to the death stock. We're talking about the close of 2019, a, the amount of revenue that was available to you could not cover your compensation plus your debt servicing. Clearly, you were already mismanaging the country big time. Deficit financing at the close of 2019 stood at 7.5%. Of course, what they normally do is to hide some portion under the line, claiming that that one is for what you call energy sector bailout or financial sector bailout. We had met this same energy sector bailout and financial sector bailout. We never hid them. We put them above the line for everybody to know. Mm. They come and hide it, mm. thinking that they are being smart. Okay. Let me hear, uh, Stephen. I have said uh, I'll let you do some five minutes, but you've done about ten minutes. Let's hold on, on oh. there. Now, now, he's talking about concerns that resonate with a lot of the population. We have heard people say some of these things. Of course, he mentions neighboring countries where they are not doing as is going on. But if you check in, in Nigeria, for example, we understand that they have slipped into recession and they are blaming it on COVID-19 and oil prices. How do you respond to what he's talking about? And he thinks that heavily you must have spent recklessly, he says, on electioneering campaign. We know that averagely on, in elections, some seven to $10 billion, uh, $10 billion 
is spent for just elections. I don't know how much he knows you guys spent that he's talking about. Um, Samson, I think it's quite unfortunate. I had really wanted this whole discussion to be done um, devoid of too much politics. Oh. But where he's taking... No, you. No. Oh, oh, please, can you let me talk? Oh. Please, please. When you were talking, I really kept quiet. Can you allow him to keep quiet? Please. I wanted us to find out what is happening now. Yes, do that. The problems mm. and the way out. Do that. Because before I even speak on these issues, we are not in a normal situation. It's affected. And even the PFM Act, 2016 Act 921, Section 18, talks about the fact that in times such as this, we are supposed to even suspend our fiscal targets and rules. But it's unfortunate. Mm. If we want to do politics of comparisons and trend analysis and reference point, I'm surprised he's saying all these things. Let's check the figures that even pre-covered economy and even covered economy and what they took over, that he's giving different figures. Oh, yeah? I am even surprised. Tell me, tell me. The year 2000 that they took over, what did they give? To, what, what did they take over? They took over over seven percent when they were leaving power for. No, no, please, no, you just no. Talk. Can I, I talk? No, no, mean. please. Can you are asking him. Yeah, you ask me. No, I'm not. Oh, but he also referred. So go ahead and make your presentation. What I'm you making is that. What the point I'm making is that they left over power for us to continue and giving us the mandate. The GDP growth at that time was about 3.4, 3.7. Lending rate was beyond 30 percent. Even, even government's own interest rate, policy rate, was 25.5%. Mm. If you take away from that, talking about T-bills, we are running around 22.5%. Policy rate today, average is around 14%. GDP growth, before the, budget, uh, uh, the COVID economy, we're having annual average of about 7%. Now we're having even lending rate reduced by a huge amount in terms of basis point. So what exactly is he talking about? Remember, is you have your notes for over? this uh, discussion on the budget spread in front of you. Speak to it before you run out of time. <laughs> no, no, but he made mention of this. Okay, and I'm ahead. proving to him okay. that he is telling Ghanaians lies. Mm. Rather, what we need to do is that if this is not COVID, how come even IMF estimated that the world economic growth will go down by over 3%? This is a global issue. And once it's a global issue, even talking about taxes, they introduce about 10 different taxes, financial administrative tax, taxes on pharmaceutical products that are not produced in Ghana, petroleum tax, and all those things. Now, now they took over, either reduced or scrapped entirely 15 different tax components. But now that we're having this situation, of course, our debt levels are going beyond 70% of our GDP. Government has immediate need in terms of inevitable obligations to perform in the area of our social uh, uh, development, in the area of our infrastructure, in the area of our statutory obligations and other things. But let's ask ourselves. People are asking you to justify the taxes in this budget and like they have said now almost were ridiculing the government nope. that someone says you thought government was giving you freebies mm -hmm. government not all free were there so now you are paying now, for now, it let me ask you is there anywhere in the world that mm. any government led by anybody uses his good pocket money to fund projects and programs this is ridiculous right on the part of the person government has a capital structure to be respected and the structure is either debt revenue grants and royalties so what happens if government immediately needs to perform obligation to save this country bring back life restore our fiscal policies consolidate continue and complete the good projects that the government is doing where does the government get money from so if anybody says share politics and probably the person is displaying his ego trips all that we are saying is that at this point in time even as expansionary fiscal policies that we adopt as a capitalist, no one on this earth thinking about the future of this country, gen the future generation, the forward movement of this country, the progress of this country, will say that a government that has reduced or taken away about 15 different task components under him mm. does not have what it takes pragmatically as a measure to introduce some few taxes in the short term to curb the situation, stabilize this country. May I, may I remind you I to pay shocked. attention to your notes at least in the next three, four minutes? I am shocked. Yeah. The notes I have here, that's right. why I was going to talk about the fact that we need to understand that this situation calls for 
broader discussions of our a country in terms of stabilizing our economy and making sure that most of these problems that we encounter today in the near future will not go through. But for anybody to say, all these times, who has given any prudent alternative measure to curb the situation? They talk about expansion of fiscal policies whose ramifications will take about two, three years. It is not going to work within the short term now. So what we are saying is that under this government, his Excellency Nanado Danko Kufuado's government, in terms of managing COVID-19, is one of the best. When you were having productivity going down, even private sector, 770,000 workers' wages had to be reduced. About 42,000, they had to lose their jobs. I mean, stock exchange was growing down from 14% to about 12.2%. We're having industries going down. The TUC says that you won't have this, and you won't have it uh, lying down. What is the meaning of that? Because you just unilaterally just wake up and say, get ready. You are not going to get pay rises. But who said or that? Or you won't get it as much who as... Who said that? Let, no, we know that one technical man, he was giving his projections and assertions. Okay? I don't think this government officially has come out with official document to say A, B, C, D. But all that we know is that we are not in good timings. This situation is an outlier. And we need to manage our fiscal levels very well, our fiscal balance mm. and our debt levels. Mm. So if you want this country to continue to enjoy the water situation we are having, electricity situation we are having, infrastructure programs that we are having, proper policies that we are implementing, ensuring that in terms of essential activities such as education, health, we want continuity, completion and consolidation, a government will have to fund it. Okay. And there should be good policies and not good pocket money to do that. And uh, anybody right. that really mm. wants the future of this country mm. to go on very well and ensure that good things are done, this is the best policy option that we need now gentlemen that very sincerely i regret this but we have to make time get you guys to commit to return to continue with the budget in the specifics in the manner that we had anticipated so we have long time to yes because yes. we obviously have run out of our time um you have some 20 seconds if you want to make any rebuttals to some of the issues that he has raised Anyway, as I said, the uh, term clearly uh, was not on our side. But let me just uh, uh, quickly finish by saying that uh, what had happened to all the so-called claim that we're moving from taxation to production? What had happened to that? What had happened to the claim that what you call it is a lazy mass approach to government to depend on taxation, <coughs> to depend on borrowing? What had happened to all the magical claims that you made? That somehow when you came, you were not going to depend on taxation to be able to do what it is you have done. What had happened to all that? Mm. It just shows that you, all, all you do is simply to use what you call empty words. But when it comes to the real delivery, it's a mm. good. All right. The conversation about you, whether you perform better than us, let's have another day. And okay. I can tell you, you simply will not. I'm be very to grateful. Fifi Fiave Kwete, former Deputy Minister of Finance and former member of the Finance Committee of Parliament, Dr. Stephen Amwa, MP in Shaisu, and former CEO of Microfinance and Small Loan Centre, Dr. Theo Echampong. You know you are a good friend. So as for you, we can always <laughs> take it for granted that you will forgive us. He's economist and political risk analyst. And of course, John Ewa joined us earlier, chief executive of the Ghana Association of Bankers. Those of you who have been asking about Kweku Bako, Kweku Bako will be back. He should have been back. But unfortunately, I'm sure some of you know by now that uh, just two weeks ago or so, he lost his mom, wow. and Kokubako is presently mourning his mom. Our, our condolences, con uh, our condolences, sincere sympathies uh, with no, no. Uh, him and his family. I'm Samson Ladia Yanini. We are run out of time. We join you next week with yet another edition of News File. Have a good afternoon.